So Alex, you are a user of artificial intelligence. You you turned me on to to using it to make myself more efficient and uh, and probably better spoken as well. Uh, if only it worked for podcasts. So how do you use AI in your uh, in your professional work? So first off, we're talking about generative AI, right? So we're talking about like the chat GPT and Claude and those kinds of things, correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I um, I use it to kind of do my first drafting, right? Like I have all sorts of thoughts. Uh, I dump them in uh, and then I start asking for communication products like uh, write me campaign emails or um, organize this into a presentation outline. And, you know, it's not it's not perfect. But what it does is it just gives me some ideas to get me started uh, and moving much more quickly. So that's that that's how I use it. How do you use it? Not as much as I should. Honestly, I should use it. it I should use it more. I find it as a um, like an icebreaker when I'm stuck on something. I don't know how to start. I'll put some ideas in of uh, things that I want to say. And uh, then it, it gives me a little feedback on on what I'm trying to say, either like, oh my God, that's not at all what I was looking to say. So clearly my key points are not a value. Let me try again. So that's how I use it. I guess I'm still easing in to it. It's been a few months now, but uh, that's how I use it. I um, My question though then is, you know, we're, uh, we both use it to make ourselves more efficient. And I'd say even in my dabbling and your use of it, it has certainly been a, a tool that is a value. How do we teach kids? Like, hopefully Mary Beth has that for us. How do we, how do we teach kids to use these tools, right? I'm actually even more concerned because it's, it's fairly intuitive. Once you get a few prompts under your belt and you start to, to use it, you can start to see the potential. It's hard to sort of envision it until you start to use it. That is more of my, my concern is not so much how do you teach students to use it. My concern is how do you teach teachers not to be afraid of it? That's what I mean, right? That's it. The kids will figure it out. I don't even know that you have to teach them. It, yeah. But how do we do it safely for them? How do we how do we guide them in using it? But those questions is why we do need to teach students how to use it. Like I it's don't a, think I don't think just sort of saying, "Okay, these are these tools, you should try them out and go use them" is the developmentally appropriate way for us to work with kids. But we're not there to do that. I think teachers need to guide them through the opportunities and pitfalls, right? And some of the ethical questions, but getting teachers to become comfortable with embracing the ethical questions as part of their teaching and recognize that using these tools is going to be part of the sort of information workforce. And and so how do we adjust what we do in the classroom to make space for that rather than just reject it outright because of cheating. You know what I mean? I can't wait for the discussion to see what uh, what Mary Beth thinks about this. I think it's going to be great. I actually saw Mary Beth present at a uh, at a recent uh, online AI conference and her stuff is is really, really incredible. And so um, she's done a lot of much deeper thinking about this than either you or I, which again is a fairly low bar. We're, we're limited because we haven't found organic intelligence yet amongst ourselves. So that, that is she's cheating. She's using her brain. <laughs> well, this should be this should be a good interview. So looking forward to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's find out what Mary Beth has to say. Hi, everyone. Today's guest is Mary Beth Hertz. Mary Beth has dedicated over 15 years to education in Philadelphia, consistently at the intersection of technology and learning. As the author of Digital and Media Literacy in the Age of the Internet, she provides a comprehensive guide for educators navigating the digital realm. She's not just confined to the classroom. As the founder of Walkabout Philly, she's taking proactive steps to evolve the educational model. And we'll talk about that at the end of the show, so stay with us. Recognized as one of ISTE's emerging leaders and named among technically Philly's realist connectors of 2023, her impact extends well beyond her immediate students. Mary Beth has been a friend for years. Mary Beth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for that intro, Alex. Nice to be here. So let's go ahead and just start with um, sharing a little bit about your journey into ed tech. Take us through kind of the moments that ignited your passion for integrating technology into education and how this led to your current focus in, in AI, ethics, and policy. Yeah, so um, it's I'll try to keep it short because it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> but I um, back in 2005, I was um, teaching 
at an elementary school, I was teaching students science. And I was the only person in the building who wasn't scared of computers. And so I became the technology teacher leader in the building. So um, these were was white IMAX and they had like 128 megabytes of memory and they would start to slow down when we had to update them. And I would pop the old memory cards out of dead ones and run around and like double the memory to 256. So, um, so that was kind of my foray, my first foray into like tech technology in schools. And then um, the next year they got a grant for uh, desktops and I magically just became the like computer lab teacher (laughs) with no training, with a lab with like daisy chain to power strips along the bottom. Cause this was a, you know, Philly public school built in like the 1920s. (laughs) Um, So, uh, so there was no real curriculum except for like Microsoft word and Excel. And I was teaching kindergarten through, um, through sixth grade. So this was also right around the time the web 2.0 came out. Okay. So this was where all of a sudden the interactive web, oh my gosh, <laughs> you can interact with the internet, right? There's blogging and there's commenting and there's all this. And so, um, I, I, I don't know why I joined Twitter. Oh, the ISTE conference. Nice. I joined Twitter. It was the two 2009, maybe one in DC. Right. And I joined Twitter and all of a sudden discovered there were other teachers doing this and trying these things and connected with them. Um, and it really just took off from there. Um, I was, you know, as a computer lab teacher, you're the only teacher that does what you do in the building. You have no peers, you have no support group, you have nobody, no grade group, no content area group. So that Twitter became my, my content area team, if you were, as it were. Um, that solidarity, so, by the, yeah, I mean, I basically, by the way, that solidarity yeah. is exactly why Bob got into technology in the first place. So nobody understood what he mm. did and nobody bothered him. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so I see Alex has opened the attack here. So right, you started. <laughs> no, it's, okay. it's okay. I can take it. I can take Sorry. it. Sorry. Go Twitter, on, Harry. Twitter. <laughs> No, it is. No, it is. It is a lonely, lonely place. I mean, I, I was, um, you know, I, I ran the technology department at my current school and um, and then was a director of educational technology. And yeah, I mean, it's people think you're like this magician. And I'm like, actually, I'm just really good at like keywords and search terms. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's pretty much that's my that's how I am able to do my job. I actually when um I was tech director at Friends Select, I got I have a I'm a I'm a crafty person. I have a cricket and I made uh, a fairy dust. Like I I ironed it onto one of my pockets in my my scrub shirt and I would walk in and like pretend to sprinkle fairy dust on things. So <laughs> um cuz it was that was that was basically people were like you just do magic. So So we yeah, so have I, our first marketing the, opportunity here Alex. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, well, with fairy dust. Fairy dust. Yeah. Because <laughs> I always get it's it it started working when you walked in. I don't understand. Yeah. Magic. I wiggle finger. my fingers like this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like yeah. This. <laughs> it knows I'm here. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I mean it just basically came down and, and I and I'll back up and maybe this is adding too much to the story, but like um as a woman growing up in the nineties, no one told me that girls could do computers. And so, but my dad built computers for fun because he's he's one of those kinds of like, he's a contractor. Um, And so he likes to build with his hands. So I was always around computers. Like I remember typing C colon backslash windows to get into windows on DOS, like those kinds of things. So I was, I was exposed to it and I wasn't scared of them because I had them, had it in my house. So, um, but I always say that like, if I had, I wonder, I always wonder in the back of my head, if I had known that girls could do this stuff at a younger age, would I, would I still, would I be doing something differently, different, I guess. Um, I, that's just a question that I always have in the back of my head. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I just, that's kind of my journey into, that was a really long story. Um, that that was, uh, that was my journey into ed tech is just kind of not being scared when everybody else was scared An opportunity opened its, opened the door. I jumped in and I also, um, I, I discovered about myself. That's the fun part of being over 40. You like learn things about yourself. <laughs> um, I discovered that I, one of the reasons I love teaching is because I love learning and I get to learn and I get paid to learn every day. And so for me, um, that like that challenge, right. Of walking in and being like, okay, I have 32 desktops. They're in boxes. I have 32 little desks and like five power strips and two outlets. <laughs> like, what? Let's make it happen. You know? So 
and a projector on a cart projecting on a chalkboard that is like literally slate, like old school slate. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that, I don't know where to end that story. Well, let me, let but me that's transition kind of you actually like. towards the, <laughs> towards AI and ethics, because like, you know, you, I, I get that journey um, similar to mine. I mean, the, the principal who first hired me to be a tech director was actually interviewing me for an English teaching position and a debate coaching job. And his question was, do you do computers? And I figured if that's the way you ask the question, you have no idea how to evaluate the answer. So my, my answer was, yes, I do. And um, I love that Alex immediately decided, okay, I'm smarter than this person in this area. I'm going to use that to my advantage. (laughs) So, so, but, but the, the sad part is there are people that do that for nefarious reasons. Well, true. You did it for the right reason. Yeah. Well, I, you're giving me perhaps too much credit, but the, um, <laughs> you needed <laughs> right. Exactly. I, yeah, I had whatever. loans. That's not nefarious. I had loans and he did not know how to answer the, <laughs> he did not know how to evaluate the answer. Yes. <laughs> so, but, um, so that gets you into, into technology, but there are a, a lot of people who are still struggling with the notion of AI in education. And you have um, jumped in with both feet. I was going to say embraced, but embraced is probably not the right word. And that's what we're going to dive into a little bit in this episode. But like you, you've absolutely jumped into to AI in education. How did that sort of come about? Yeah, I mean, I, um, and embrace your right is probably not the right word. And yeah, we'll get to that later. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess maybe just being, in the classroom at that time when everything was changing so quickly and no one really understood what the impact of all this like blogging and micro blogging and social media and all this stuff was, it just felt very familiar. Um, and so it, perhaps in that way, um, it didn't like, I just was like, okay, so this is it. This is, this is the next thing. Like this is, we've been chugging along, chugging along, chugging along. This is the web well, Web3 is a whole other, uh, this is, yeah. some people would consider AI a part of Web3, some people wouldn't, but um, but this is like the next thing um, that feels very similar to the way Web2 felt, with the difference being that with Web2, and, and in some ways there are some ways this is different, but with Web2, we really had no frame of reference at all, right? Like nothing. We didn't understand what the data, where the what data was being collected. We didn't understand how these tools were made. We were just so excited about how cool they were. I mean, I remember Google Wave, right? Oh, remember right. that? Yeah. Like, it was oh, so sure. cool. Google Wave. It's gone now, but like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, just just those kinds of like the exciting, like the magic of it, right? It really did feel magic, and it did. And there were so many great things about how it connected people, and you know, teachers finding each other, people finding each other, and and that connection. But um, but, you know, and then slowly but surely we find out what's going on and what's been going on that we uh, behind under the surface, right, that we didn't know. Yeah. So for me, um, I almost felt like it was my imp- like my not my job, but like it was like super important for those of us who were there at that time to speak out about our experiences and make sure that we didn't screw it up like we did before. Like I always used to say back then that we basically you know, we threw kids out on the playground and never taught them how to play, right? We never, we never guided them. There were no adults out there teaching them how to navigate the, that like digital space that they were in. And now, you know, we're almost making some of the same mistakes. We can get to that conversation. But I think for me, the, um, the reason I jumped in was because of that, just feeling like I had a, I had, um, a perspective that would be helpful, but also feeling that it was kind of, because I, I feel like, I was part of the problem in some ways back then, right? right? Like of the evangelizing of this cool stuff that turned out to be like maybe problematic. Um, that I or it's just I didn't fully understand that I felt it was really important for me to to share um my perspective and my experiences to hopefully guide us towards making a better decisions, more informed decisions um than we did in the past. Awesome. I hope that I don't uh <laughs> I, I don't make this too long. I, we're going to talk about AI some here, but uh, 
how do I put this? I'm a certain age <clears throat> in which there was a movie that I was recently watching from when I was a wannabe engineer and not an actual engineer yet. <clears throat> and they talked about artificial intelligence and, you know, not to give too much away, but this was in the mid eighties and they talked about artificial intelligence. And my recollection of my first computer was that it had 64 K of memory. <laughs> yes. K not M not G K of memory. And yet we <laughs> talked about artificial intelligence. So it's not something new for us. And um, in a little quick uh, Google keyword, uh, Alan Turing's imitation test takes us to AI back to 1950, which is well before my time, in case anybody is wondering. But maybe not Alex's. Alex might remember that. You're older than me. Um, Just want to make sure that that's so, on the record. Um, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, we'll cut them open and count the rings at some point. Um, so I, something that you said about technology, I, when you were talking about your, you ended up in technology because you weren't afraid. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, when Alex asks her about AI, it's going to be the same answer. You weren't afraid. So we work with schools in which the leaders of the schools are afraid of AI and they run from it. And we have others who truly do embrace it, like Alex. Um, so I guess my first question is, we we're talking about AI back to Alan Turing before there were, you know, they were even they were using vacuum tubes for computers to much more my time when, you know, <laughs> K of RAM um, and computers that still took up whole rooms to now we're still talking about artificial intelligence. So what is artificial intelligence for us to talk about? What what do you think, Mary? Beth? So I my favorite thing I ever heard somebody say, and I wish that I had written down who said it was AI is like an eager intern that sometimes lies to you. Wow. <laughs> so that's kind of how I try to explain <laughs> Like that to me, like that clicked for me where, um, you know, it's, it's really excited, right. To do this thing for you because it's what it's like exists to do. Um, but it doesn't actually have the intelligence to quite see the context for understanding what it's doing. It's like, it takes directions very well, <laughs> but, um, but it also spits out garbage. So I think for me, um, that's generative AI, right. And one, the lesson I did with my, students this week, um, there's a really great graphic I found is concentric circles, right? And the outside circle is artificial intelligence, the inside circle is machine learning, and the very center circle is deep learning. So I show them that image, and then talk about how artificial intelligence is just computers doing things that like humans usually do, right? When we want to talk about what it is. And then on the next slide, so we've been kind of what we've the way we've gotten to this point in the in the unit is We've started by learning about how the internet works, what are packets, what is IP addresses, how does how does data travel through the internet? They look up their own IP address, we look it up on IP Sniper, and they're like, holy crap, it's on a map, you know, and they understand like just understanding how data moves through the internet and, and what's happening, because that's the basis for understanding all of the concerns around privacy, tracking, data, like all that kind of stuff. So we start with that infrastructure understanding, and I swear this is coming to artificial intelligence, but um but then we talk, we look at cookies and they look at like websites that are tracking cookies. And then we look at, um, we talk about different ways that the companies can profile you, right? You don't fill out your race on Netflix, but they know what race you are, right? They know by what you watch. And we talk about recommendations and what do we think about that? Is that good? Is that bad? Some, you know, for some of them, they're like, I love being recommended stuff. Right. And so, um, so I, we've done all that work coming up to this point, um, talking about, and we also talk about like, you know, the, the way that, um, like hacking works, right? Like how your data, you give your data to these companies. And then if those data, if those companies are hacked, now your data is someplace else. Also, that's illegal. But then there's also legal ways those companies are selling your data. And so just understanding all that stuff. And then today, actually, it was at the first last time I did it was yesterday. But, um, after the, I show them the, the circles, I show them a list of all the applications of artificial intelligence that they've already experienced, which is every single thing we've been talking about for the last like two weeks, right? <laughs> all those things that, um, that the students have been learning about AI is used to build those profiles and to do all that tracking. And so I try to help them see that like, you know, like you were saying, Bob, like this is not new. This is not new stuff that artificial intelligence as a broad thing is nothing new. The generative stuff, the deep learning is the new stuff. You know, the idea of the neural network, mimicking neural networks and having um, and how and the machine learning piece, right? Like that's the stuff that is now and even that's not new, but it's new to us because open AI was like, have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I think, uh, yeah, so I guess 
as far as the long winded answer to your very simple question, um, I think there, I, I, what I hear happen is people say AI when what they mean is generative AI or machine learning, right? And so, and large language models and those kinds of things. So, um, I, I think it's important that people understand that AI isn't new and it's not something that's like magic and fancy that it's actually everywhere and has been everywhere because I think that's, that goes into us understanding what's, how is it being used in ethical and unethical ways um, every day in our own lives? So that's the really long winded answer. <laughs> that's great though, because, you know, we've had conversations at our own company about um, AI in schools. And one of the things that Bob has regularly said is, hey, we talk about AI as though it's new and it's not new. Like, like it was interesting for me to kind of hear somebody else in this planet actually validate Bob Cerruti. It doesn't happen very often. So that was, that was fun. That was from an, <laughs> just from an entertainment side. That was fun. I got, I got you, Bob. <laughs> but the, um, Mary Beth, we're going to tell them how it is here shortly. <laughs> so that was, that was good, but it was also um, great to kind of hear at the beginning of your answer, talking about like how you share this with students and, and sort of how you sort of guide through that. So let's, Let's move from that esoteric sort of uh, what is AI and into the classroom. So from like a curriculum standpoint, a lesson design standpoint, what what changes should happen? Uh, like what do you do? And you can expound a little bit on what you what you do as you already started to describe. But also what should teachers do that aren't teaching AI? What kind of curricular changes should we be making to prepare students to live in this world that has all of those connector or all of those collectors and connectors that you were just talking about. Yeah. And it's, it's tricky, right? Because one of the things as I, this summer, I dug into a lot of the privacy policies on these tools yeah. and we really shouldn't be using them with students. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like unless you're, I mean, I, I mean, I, if you look at their privacy policy, the only one that says, um, that says you don't have to be 18 is ChatGPT and ChatGPT uses your data to train its models. Right. So if students are putting stuff in there and, you know, we can get permission from parents, we can do all that. That's, you know, we, there is, there are processes for that, but I'm probably in the minority <laughs> in saying that, like, I, I struggle with that, right. Of like putting this in the hands of students because of the data, because, you know, for me, um, well, first of all, ChatGPT, the district blocked it, but they didn't block Claude AI. Um, I use Claude because of the constitutional AI piece and they don't use their data to train their model. That's like their, so, so, um, so I feel like more comfortable. GTP or Claude, it was created by folks who left open AI okay. and they left open AI and they started Claude.ai. And it's, um, it's a model that has, it's called cons, they call it constitutional AI. So rather than having humans sit there and look at all this stuff and go, that's good. That's bad. That's like a human tuning is what they call it. They built the model to have values and to train itself on its own values. So it's basically um, the idea is that one of the one of the points they make, and this is totally off topic, but it's like one of those things that I don't think people think about is that um, the same way Facebook pays people like five cents an hour in Indonesia to look at porn and uh, suicides and horrendous content on Facebook and flag it. They're doing this. These companies, these AI companies are paying humans to do the same thing. So open AI is still paying humans to look at this, these horrendous things and flag them and train the model to be like, no, thank you. So Claude AI is trying to cut down on the human tuning piece of that kind of stuff by having the, uh, building a model that kind of checks itself, like goes back to its own pro like training and goes like, okay, d does this fall back into my constitution of how I should be um, responding or, or giving answers. I'm sure it's flawed. I was say, doesn't that kind of <laughs> flawed, flawed. its own sort um, of they, Well, they do, they have, they say they have human tuning. It's not that they don't have human tuning. They have okay. both. So the model has both human tuning and also um, that, that set of values that's, that is set on and right. are that it, it is um, trained on. But that's a, this is all a side note. But um, but I guess for me, well, it's that's not a side note, Mary Beth. This is exactly <laughs> this is are, so. Yeah. You you said something <laughs> that that made me think is like so. You said the district blocked Chat GPT, right? Because 
it's my supposition that 90% of the educators think AI is chat GPT. So mm-hmm. that's what gets blocked. Email shout off to the tech department, block chat GPT. We can't have this, this stuff in the, but they miss everything else. They right. miss the <laughs> teachers. The teachers have well, an the echo te- dot in their classroom, it, you know, to play I'm using music. It as a teacher. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> we can't right. stream. They block streaming because of the bandwidth. So you can't, you can't stream Spotify and you can't, um, I think the bandwidth and also probably the, the copyright infringement, but, um, so, but yeah, I guess my point there is, is your, it was from what you said is just that it's not new. AI is not new, but they hear chat GPT in the news or, or from colleagues and they say that's the AI and they shut it down, but it's coming anyway, right? Of all the people in a school, educators, administrators, students, parents, community, who's not afraid of it? The kids. The kids aren't afraid of it. Everybody else doesn't know, but the kids will dive right on in. And the kids are using we- it on their phone <laughs> and they're just hot spotting to their phone to get around the network. So, yep. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to poke back to <clears throat> some of the, you know, what kind of advice can we give teachers? And I guess um, maybe we can cut this part out. Cause summar- let me summarize and we can see if there's a question here. So your advice for teachers is is really you need to understand this and maybe they shouldn't be using that. Are there are there tools that uh, teachers can and should uh, use with their students? Yeah. So I think two, two, well, maybe two, three thoughts. I would say as far as like not using it, I, I won't I won't go so far as saying not using it. I think the mistake that we made back in the day was we got so excited that we just threw this stuff in the hands of kids because it was cool, right? Like, look what it can do. But we didn't really always think about whether it actually was like teaching anything or like better than what we were already doing or had any kind of like added value, right? It was just like, look at this cool thing. So I guess what I worry about is that, you know, the teachers would be like, oh, the AI thing. The kids love the AI thing. I got to do the AI thing, right? And that they feel like they have to jump in on the bandwagon and like use AI with their students because it's like the thing that that is like what I need to do without really understanding the applications of it that are the most helpful and useful because until teachers use it and see how it helps them, how can we possibly teach students how, like, so for me right now, like to your question, for me, you know, I've been talking with my, I talk with my, my colleagues about like, oh, well, you know, you can upload a PDF of your UBD stage one and stage two, and it'll do all your daily lesson plans. Right. And they're like, what? You know, like if, cause it'll read claw.ai, you can upload a PDF, it'll read the PDF and you just tell it, I need, this is how many days I have. This is how long a class period is. Can you break down this unit into that many days? And it, it looks at my essential questions. It looks at my central, my, my understandings, my, you know, my skills, like all the things I've outlined of what I want students to know in the unit. And it just plans it out day by day. Um, and I get, I, what I always say is it gets you about 80% there yeah. on everything. AI, right at this point, generative AI is about 80% there. The other 20%, you got to, that's that human tuning piece, yeah. right? So for me, um, the biggest, the biggest, um, the most important thing is for teachers to see the value in it, but also understand that it's more than just like generating a five paragraph essay, yeah. right? The, the idea of, of it leveraging it as a thought partner and leveraging it to have conversations and, and to, and to probe it, right? To give you more or, or to refine or to, to do those kinds of things, because until teachers really understand that aspect of it, there's no way that we're going to know how to guide students through that use of it, which is the way we want students to use. I mean, there's a lot of potential for these tools to, you know, especially when we talk about inquiry, right? I mean, I work at an inquiry based school. How much, how better could you get at like teaching kids how to ask good questions, right? Right. So they, they, and, and having, you know, have, and, or like, learning how to ask follow-up questions or get feet what kind of questions do i ask to get the right kind of feedback that i'm looking for or those kinds of things running a school or district is hard your tech shouldn't be with hp as your trusted partner and program success you get more than just beautiful future-proof technology you get a team dedicated to your growth experience cutting-edge innovation unmatched reliability and personalized support all tailored to fit your unique needs from high-performance laptops and printers to innovative software solutions, HP has you covered wherever you work. Visit us today at hp.com or stsed.com. I have no idea if you if that's your term or you heard it, but thought partner struck me. That is an outstanding description of using um, artificial intelligence to uh, 
to get to the heart of something, to figure it out. Alex and I both use it in our in our daily work as well to get us 80% of the way. But if we don't know the questions to ask, or if we don't know what we're trying to get at, we don't get anywhere any sooner. So I, I really like that. But here's here's a question, or I'd like you to clarify maybe is, I agree with you. Teachers need to use it. One, it'll make them more efficient. It'll, it'll improve their ability to teach because it frees them up from the mundane stuff of dividing out hours into periods. But if they don't come fast, the kids will be using it anyway. They, I guarantee you 80% of their students knew about open, um, open AI long before they had ever heard of it. So what can we do to get teachers to get going? Because the kids are going to use it. And it's one of those things, if we don't guide them, it's kind of the Wild West. They're going to figure it out. They're going to get into their own trouble with it. They're not going to learn the best practices with it. So what can we do to get those teachers going so that they're prepared to lead the students? Yeah, and it's and I'll, I'll start by saying what's fascinating. I don't know if it's because they were lying to me. I asked my students, I say, how many have heard of ChatGPT? Most of them raised their hand, right? And then I look at them and I say, no judgment because I use it to write my lesson plans. Who has used ChatGPT? Four out of like 20 kids will raise their hand. I, 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 this, and this is something that I struggle with too, is I have found that a lot of the assumptions we make about kids are centered in privilege or centered in access privilege. And so I wonder, this is an inquiry question I have, is the assumption we have that all kids are using it accurate in all settings everywhere. And so I, that's just something I'm a, a little thing that I wonder, but I would say as far as the, um, the teachers go, um, what I don't think will work, which is what we tried with Twitter back in 2009 was like, Twitter's so cool. You should make an account. You're going to be awesome. And you're going to learn a lot and you're going to have a PLC and you're going to, blah, 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 right. And then we're like, Oh wait, joining Twitter isn't actually the thing <laughs> that's going to change your educational life. Right. So I don't know that just saying you have to use it is the right thing so much as having structured conversations around what is our approach as a school? What values do we have as a school and what makes the most sense as to how we approach this? Because you're going to have teachers all over the place. You're going to have teachers who want it blocked, right? You're going to have teachers who are like, don't block it because I want to use it. You have teachers who are saying, I use it for my lesson planning here at school. Like, please don't block it, right? You have all kinds of places. And I think it can get confusing too, as a kid, especially in, if they're being, if in one class you're being told you're plagiarizing and another class you're being encouraged to use it. Like how do we as teachers and as educators um, come to a shared understanding of our policies, our approach, our understanding of how we think these tools belong in our community? Um, and that, I mean, that's just something I, something I worry about is the conversations are always about use it or don't, you know, like yeah. instead of like the whys or the, the yeah. real understanding of the value add to, to the tool. So this is just something I thought about, Mary Beth, when you said four students raise their hands. I, I would be the kid. It was a long time ago but when I was in high school. We've already established this, but um, <coughs> I would have been the kid who used artificial intelligence. And then unless it was my very favorite trusted teacher like Mr. Wampum or Miss Parrish, I would have never admitted to it because yeah. I know I'm not supposed to use it because it's blocked. So clearly it's something I shouldn't be using. I mean, right. It's blocked like porn. It's blocked like other bad things like violence, like guns. We have lumped artificial intelligence, this great, powerful tool that will impact these students' careers. Like the, we can teach them word. Mm -hmm. We can teach or them. It is impacting. Yeah, it is, right. Math, right. That's right. the thing. But, it is but impacting. But AI is that's, the yeah. thing that they've got <laughs> now that you, we can guarantee will be with them their whole life. So mm -hmm. I just, I have this problem with blocking tools, even if, and I would have lied. I would have been like, nope, I never used that before. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> My ability to write papers is just vastly improved. Um, <laughs> so with, are there... Um, so I'd like to get these tools into teachers' hands and into students' hands. So what platforms or what, what can we use? What can teachers use that we feel good about and that they can yeah, yeah. manage? If there and are I, any. And I, well, I guess, so one thing that I saw, and I can't remember where I saw it, um, was a very interesting application of, not application like like app, app but like application so. of um, the use of it, right? So um, a teacher had a station in their classroom that was the chatbot station. So if you needed a thought partner, you could walk up to the chatbot station and you can ask your questions and do your thing and and have a conversation so that 
It was not logged. The students weren't, it wasn't logged into a student's oh. account. It wasn't like the students were using it, but it was, and it was allowed, right? It was like, there's the chat, there's the chat bot. If you need to just work something out. Um, the other piece, my colleague, um, uh, and I actually, this was a, um, oh gosh, where was it? Um, I'm trying to remember where the article was written, but it was, oh, it was, it was, um, Larry Ferlazzo did has did all summer a whole bunch of stuff on AI. And so he featured um, a little snippet about my, me and my colleague. But um, sh- so there is uh, a tool. I know this is so bad that I'm not remembering it. Um, oh, God. Youth Voices. So so she partnered with the um, founder of Youth Voices, and he, he actually incorporated the eight chat GPT API into the tool. So the thought partner idea isn't something I made up. It's something that came from the conversations that I have with her about what she was doing with that tool because students were training the AI to give, to give them specific feedback, pretend you are a blah and give me blah, blah, blah. Right. So they were training the AI to be a thought partner and give them specific kinds of feedback on their writing and, and also to kind of begin to, cause she's an English teacher. So it's a big, and also to help them formulate ideas. And so um, that was incorporated into the tool. What I did find in my research, and I don't know if it's changed at all, but um, from what I read, the API of ChatGPT does not train the model. So if you're using well, you, ChatGPT setting, proper. Yeah. To my understanding, it's a setting when you do the API connector that you can choose yeah. whether or not it, it gets absorbed by uh, the, the tool to, um, to train the model. You know. Yeah. And most software developers do not want to feed their data to chat GPT. So in general, they tend to turn it off. And this was the guy, um, Paul Allison is his name, but he was, he built it and he definitely had it off. But, but to me, like, that's what I want to see more of is where you have that safer version of it, right? The API version of it incorporated. I know that's what Comingo is also trying to do. Comingo, um, I have thought I wrote down thoughts on coming though. Maybe I can find them. But um, but that's like, you know, to me, that is where we'd have to go to to have these tools really be able to be put into the hands of students. But then it, I also still worry, right? Like the black box of what these companies are doing with the data that our students are putting in there. Because unlike other stuff, like the conversations kids could have with these things, like, should I do drugs? Right. <laughs> like should I have sex? Right. <laughs> um, am I gay? Right. Like the kinds of things that kids could talk to these bots about is on a whole other level. Yeah. Um, that, and that's just the kind of, you know, and they have to log in to use them. Right. Right. You know, you can't use them without logging in. That's where the API piece, where if you're able to leverage the technology um, in a platform that's not collecting the data that has some safeguards and has some other, you know, other you know, walled garden type stuff. Um, you know, and because I think that's that's my biggest concern of putting in the hands of of kids. But I also think, um, you know, with the and I'm gonna see if I can find my notes on Comingo. I I don't remember if I wrote it down. But um, oh, that was that was that was in the personalization section ah, where I yeah, talked yeah. about Comingo. <laughs> there, there's <laughs> um, a whole discussion. There's a whole discussion to be had about <laughs> why it is kids are talking to chatbots about things like drugs, sex, gay, and not to people. Well, but that's for and another it's also time. not new, right? They were yeah. just doing private searches, right? <laughs> right. And and thank God when they no, they or they were on AOL Messenger, like talking, yeah, to, right. strangers talking to strangers in chat rooms. That. Like, you know, I I did yeah. just learn. Um, you know, we're a Microsoft training partner, and on their partner meeting, uh, just last week they mentioned Bing Chat, and so if you use the Bing Chat, mm-hmm. if you have the enterprise license for either a company right. or a school. Your chat stays in your domain. It doesn't go back to the model. It, right. It, I saw them release the enterprise version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, it, you, and you'll know it if if you're an audience member and you're wondering, do we have that? When you go to you know Bing.com/slash/chat, it'll tell you. So if it doesn't say this is the enterprise version and your information is not um, is going to stay within your organization, if it doesn't say that, then it's going back to train the model. It's going back into the organization. So. Mm-hmm. Or it's leaving your organization. So that's the saying, right, Alex? If you're paying for the enterprise version, <coughs> you get secure yeah. search. Mm-hmm. So if you're paying for the product, you get the product. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. You are the, yep. Yeah. And if you're using a Chromebook, you're just SOL. <laughs> <laughs> 
which is like what 98% of say, schools that's a, in this that's country. That's an awful lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause that's, that's, you know, so that, cause I talked to my students today, I, you know, I said, um, you know, if you, if you use the, because you can put the Bing browser on your phone, yeah. right? Like you can put the Bing app on your phone. And I said, it's built into, um, into Bing, you know, it's Microsoft owns it, bought it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but they can't, you can't use it if you're using a Chromebook. So that's, you know, that is the, the limitation of, yeah. of that. Um, and, the, and obviously the cost, right? Like, Enterprise solutions sounds great if you're a small district, a wealthy district, a, a private school just running their own system. But like realistically, um, a large district district like the like the one I work in, um, they're not buying enterprise solutions, right? Or if they are, it's for um, IEP database things or like MTSS software or like you know things like that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think the to the curriculum piece. Um, what I, my plan is because chat GPT is blocked. <laughs> um, I'm going to use Claude and I'm going to do huddle time around the, the, the smart board. We're all going to pull up our chairs and I have an external keyboard and mouse. I'm going to pull up my Claude and we're going to talk to it and we're going to just see what it does and just, you know, like have a conversation with it as a class. Um, so that they can see what it does. Mary Beth, this is fascinating. And I have so enjoyed this conversation. I wanted to ask, I said at the beginning, I was going to ask you about Walkabout Philly and you shared a little bit about that with me earlier. And I just wanted our audience to hear just a little bit about this. Tell, tell us just a little bit about sort of the walkabout model, how you understand it, uh, your experience with it. And then, uh, and then tell us what it's <laughs> like to try to start a school. Yeah, I actually, I had, it's funny, I had um, a conversation with my assistant principal today, right after school, we were sitting in the main office. And um, I don't know why we were talking about AI, but we got talking about AI. And, you know, I was saying about, you know, how important it is. So what, so I'll back up and just say, so Walkabout Philly is an experiential learning model, right? So having kids doing internship service learning. Um, one of the, the um, challenge areas is wilderness. So like literally taking kids out into nature. In fact, um, I attended Walkabout as a senior in New York and we went on two week long backpacking trips, like 50 pound, 50 pound pack on your back. That's it for a week. Um, and so, uh, so I, what I said to him was like, we, we need to have kids engaging in things outside of school that aren't necessarily academic, that help them connect with the community, because this is the generation that is going to need kind, ethical, collaborative, caring humans, right? Humans, humanity is like the missing link <laughs> of the future, right? Because that is something that, you know, we've learned that technology has somewhat distanced us from um it's it's brought us closer together in a lot of really great ways like i would never have met half the people i've 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 had amazing experiences with without the internet right um and without social media but especially in a place where um you know and, and maybe it's because i was watching coded bias last night but the idea that you know we are being like graded by these things, right? Like that we are, people are being denied loans. People are being denied credit. People are being, you know, stereotyped and, and stuff by these tools that for me, you know, I've kind of shifted from this like ed tech focus to looking at building good humans. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, that's because the tech is nothing if we don't have good humans behind it. And what we learned is that we had, sh I won't, I won't use that word. We had terrible humans <laughs> <laughs> behind, <laughs> caught myself there. We had terrible humans building this stuff, right? You know, when you look at the, if you look at the, the work that, um, that was done in the, the, uh, and I'm, I always screw up her last name. Um, but Joy, uh, who is the, the woman who is the center of the coded bias documentary, but she is the founder of the, the, um, the, oh my gosh, not the art, the date. No, I can't, I won't mess it up. So you can cut that sure. part out. But she, she, um, you know, she, they make the point that all of these tools were built by a certain demographic and they are, um, I'm at a loss of words. They're built by a certain demographic and they disenfranchise anyone who was not from that demographic yeah. because those people don't exist within the models that these things were trained yeah. on. And so 
for me, that is, for me, that is the passion behind walkabout is having, having young people enter their adult life, having had experiences that help them understand themselves within the context of community to help them understand their skill set, understand their strengths, understand how, what they have going for them that will help them like live a healthy, happy life, but also how they can use their skills and their strengths to support other people and bring people along with them. Um, and you do that by unothering, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, we have a, 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 we have a, a group of kids who were in their houses for two years and only interacted on social media and how do we, and in their formative years often, right? They're socially formative years. So how do we get them out of their house into the community that they were like scared almost to be in for two years because it was very scary to be out there um, and give them that opportunity to really see um, see who they are in the context of the world they live in and, and see that they have a voice and that they have agency and they have value. Um, so that's kind of like become my passion. But the technology piece is there because the technology isn't going away. These are the kids that are going to be building the next thing. And so for me, the job is not just the like skills of like, can you use AI? Can you code? Can you, you know, to be a data, you know, interpret data, like all those like hard skills don't yeah. matter if you don't have a decent human, <laughs> right? like using right. them and, and thinking about ways to use them that are going to benefit society and not just benefit themselves or benefit a small group of people. So that's, that's kind of what I've been realizing. You know, I've been trying to dig into what there was a sudden shift for me where I was like, kind of feeling like the ed tech thing was kind of like fuzzy anymore. Right. I'm like, I'm not as excited about the the fancy tools and why is it? And I, I finally, it clicks for me. Like, I am excited about the tools. I am excited about what they can do, but I'm really more excited about making sure that we do the right thing with them, I guess. So I, I want to wrap with a, with a couple of, a couple of questions. So, uh, Bob, I'll let you take the second or third one. Cause I've been talking too much. I know that's quite a shocker, uh, to, to you, but, uh, Mary Beth, who, who in the world of education or ed tech would you most like to take to lunch? So I guess my, uh, my answer it's, it's, there's a lot of folks that I really would love to take to lunch because I haven't seen them like in 3D in many years. <laughs> but um, but I think for me, um, Christina Ishmael, oh, yeah. who is the director of educational, like the the um, sorry, I can't remember her title, but uh, in the office. So Christina Ishmael in the co- office of EdTech yeah. is um, one of those people who has been doing the work for a really long time, who understands the nuances of equity, access, um, data, like all this stuff is really easy to talk to, is unbelievably helpful, unbelievably kind, unbelievably um, open as a person. So when I saw that she was taking on that role, it was, um, you know, I just, I think I even sent her a message that was just like, I'm so thankful that it's you. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So I just know she'd be really fun at lunch. She likes to laugh. She has a lot of fun and she's really smart and just, a fun person. So that's my, that's who I would love to have. That lunch with. is a great answer. I have not eaten with her, but we did drink several glasses of stuff while we were talking. So um, <laughs> she's phenomenal. That's a great, that's a wonderful answer. Wonderful. Bob, you want to bring us home? <laughs> I am shocked. I am shocked that Alex talked at length while drinking adult beverages. <laughs> Something else that never happens. Must have never been give, a Never give educators alcohol. That's something my husband learned going to Christmas parties. He's like, wait, these are teachers. I was like, mm. Oh yeah. Crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, don't feed them after midnight. Right, right, right. That's right. Yes, right. exactly. <laughs> yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, so if we have covered some ground uh, today with AI and um, I think that uh, for us to bring it kind of together, bring it together, like what, what should our audience um, look for? Where should, where can they learn more about AI and, and education and the ethics of AI? for our students and, and even, even for the public at large. Yeah. So I, I've been following the work of um, AI and education, which is um, I don't know if they're just a LinkedIn group or whether I can't remember if they're like an actual, um, they have a website. Mm -hmm. um, But they have been putting out a lot of really awesome resources that kind of avoid the hype in some ways. 
Um, and you know, they're, they're not, uh, they're pretty realistic in their approach. Um, they're balanced in their approach. They're focused on, um, like the, the, the measured approach of being thoughtful and, but also providing teachers with, um, like, like things they can use right away. Like here are prompts you can use right away. Here are things you can use right away, but like webinars, but, and, you know, other resources. So it's, I've enjoyed the the stuff they've been putting out. There's a tool magicschool.ai, which um, it's, it, I believe it leverages chat GPT for, I don't know if it's, I think that's, that's what it leverages, but it has built, built in prompts. So it has like, it's built its own bots. You know, you can train a bot and then you can, I know like poe.com, you can train your own bot and put it out there and it'll, people can talk to it and like make, maybe talk to me like I'm a pirate. Right. And people can talk to it and it'll talk to you like a pirate, like that kind of thing. Except this, they built out a suite of tools for teachers that talk to teachers and generate stuff for teachers, like rubrics. There's even um, like a UDL type stuff. There's lesson plans. There's um, I can't remember all of the things, but you, you know, you, there are individual trains, little air, you know, different tools that teachers can interact with to generate things. So for this group of teachers who some had used stuff, some had never used anything, they I put them in small breakout rooms because they came from different schools. So they were with their own colleagues and you know, I'd pop in and and it was just a really easy way for them to um, understand prompting and understand with like understand how these tools could be of value to them without them having to come up with their own prompts. Because oh, cool. the prompting had been like the on the back end, the tool had kind of been pre-trained. Yeah. So um so what was neat was the people who clicked for they um they immediately were like, okay, but this is like not quite what I want. And I'm like, and that's where you take it and you copy paste it and you put it into chat GPT <laughs> and you talk to it and you train it and you and you fine tune it, right? And so it was a really neat way to get those people who um had never used anything like this before to kind of be like, whoa, what did it, what, huh, what? it just did that, you know? Um, cause you, you, there's drop down menus. Like I teach this subject, this grade. And so you're like training, telling the model about yourself and then it generates stuff. Right. Um, and then to the other end, the teachers who were ready to see that I want to tune this a little bit and they wanted, and it like prompted them that inquiry, right. It prompted them to want to go and tune it and make it better. So, um, so I found that I find the tool very limiting because I've always found pre-made stuff limiting. Mm -hmm. So if you're a teacher that like, just likes to use stuff off of teachers, pay teachers, and you don't care, it's probably great. (laughs) (laughs) But if you're the kind of teacher who, who never seems to be able to find that anybody's made the thing that you want and how you want it, it's a really great jumping off point to then go and find, fine tune, um, what you want. So, um, that those two are the to top of mind, like places that I, um, I would start. I also have a whole bunch of resources. I have like a seven page Canva (laughs) (laughs) that has, um, it's an overview of generative AI tools that are, uh, image generating and text generating. And it goes over like their privacy policy of how they use data and also what age you have to be to use it so that it's just kind of a cheat sheet for, for teachers. And then it also, some of the stuff we were talking about, um, so some of the ideas around how to approach this as a school and the kinds of things you should be thinking about centering your values around those conversations. There's a little framework in there too, that, that schools can use to kind of um, think about how the kind of how they want to ha- have the conversations around using these tools in their school. So um, that's, that's something I shared out earlier in the summer. Awesome. And, and for our listeners, we're going to be gathering uh, information uh, of, of these resources from Mary Beth, and we're going to be uh, posting them uh, with the podcast. So if you're the kind of person who doesn't like to click the button to read more and see see the the extended description, you should be that person so that you can get access to all of these resources. So Mary Beth, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, it's so bad that the uh, the rest of the listeners aren't going to listen to the fact that this was, we're now like an hour and a half into our conversation. Uh, but this <laughs> has been <laughs> Incredible. Thank you so much for um, joining us today and, and also for the, the leadership that you're providing other people in terms of making sure that being good humans sort of is at the center of all of our work with technology and education. I, I just really deeply appreciate and value that. Well, thank you so much for the time. It really, um, I, this is, 
I could keep talking forever because <laughs> it's really fascinating stuff. And it's always fun to talk to to, pe- to people um, to ask good questions. You know, it was, it was, it was a great, um, great way for me to also dig into my own thoughts. So I appreciate that opportunity. I'd like to thank you for taking my side. And I will be in touch about the new gig as co-host of this <laughs> podcast. Thank you, Alex, okay. for your time with us. Bob, uh, what, what did you think about that? So I think Mary Beth and I on the idea of generative AI in classrooms are of the same mind. I am a non-blocker kind of person. I want kids to have the tools. If it's available, I want them to have it and use it. And I think she had really good ideas about how to do that. And uh, that's... That is, uh, that's what I got out of it, is we've got to figure out a way, we as schools have to figure out a way in order for students to be able to use this in an appropriate manner, in a safe manner, but we have to. This is, this is, yeah, is yeah. I think she said at one point, you know, this isn't just for their careers, it's for their lives that they're going to have this tool. Microsoft Word may not exist, Google Sheets may not exist, but generative AI is going to be a, a way of, for them. What about you? Oh. It's already, uh, just just to, to the point of what you said, it's already showing up in almost every other tool that we have, right? Like I know of a, I know of an online teacher evaluation coaching program called Sydney, and now they've put AI into their tool. Uh, we're using ClickUp as our project management tool and AI tools are built into that. Like they're building AI into almost every, generative AI is being built into almost everything. And so these comfort, literacy, and responsibility with these tools is um, it's mandatory now. It's mandatory. And and all of this um, exploded on the scene. Now, I know it's not new, but it just it it went from something that you had to go seek to something that's in your face almost everywhere now. It it is. And, and, And that part happened overnight. That's just crazy for me. So, you know, um, I I I loved I love that conversation. A couple of things that that she said that that really resonated with me. One was using AI as a thought partner, right? Because that's yeah, absolutely both of our eyes got big when we saw that. I mean, because that's kind of how I use it. How weird is that, though? Right. To think about, like, I think the reason I didn't use that sort of term is because I don't think of a website software program as a thought partner, right? It's like the, it's like the movie her, right? <laughs> it's like, I don't need, <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm ready to call my laptop, my thought partner, but, um, but it really is. Uh, that resonated with me. And when she called it, I'm going to mess it up how she said it, but like the over eager intern, uh, you know, working with you because it's, it's smart. It's got access to lots of information, but it's just not always right. It does not have the context that, you know, an experienced human has with the subject area, which is, I think, why she said, you know, everything's sort of 80% in that, right? It made me think of this example that somebody brought to my attention once was, so I'm a baseball fan. Behind me is is some baseball memorabilia, and uh, I'm a Cleveland Guardians follower. Uh, And if I were to come home, having recorded the game for the night, and I came home from a meeting or something and asked my daughter, who's 15, I recorded the game, and she knows the results, and I say, am I going to enjoy watching it? She would know if they won, yes, you should watch it. And if they lost, she'd be like, save your time. But if I ask Generative AI, it'll say like, well, Bob, you enjoy baseball, and it's a baseball game, so of course you would enjoy watching a baseball game. <laughs> that's not what I mean, right? So that's that's not quite passing the Turing test for me. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. I, I, I love that you brought up the Turing test in the uh, in in the interview as well because you know that. Well, actually, you, you haven't watched the Imitation Game, right? With the the movie about not. Alan Turing. Yet? I you have not. To, you need to watch that. That is that is it's a fun it's a fun movie, and the movie kind of starts and ends with the Turing Game, right? And uh, and and so he sort of plays it with uh, with a detective uh, in this in this game, uh, or plays the game with him in the movie. It's a powerful and sad movie as well, but uh, but a pretty uh, certainly a fascinating, fascinating uh, film. It, it's nice to know that at the end of a podcast, you're going to assign me homework. <laughs> I, I suppose amongst homework to be assigned a couple hour movie isn't so bad. No, especially when it's a good one. Right. Anyway. Right. All right. Well, until the next uh, until the next podcast. Yeah, Alex, we'll see you again later. Take care. Learning through technology, a K-12 EdTech podcast is brought to you by Pacific One Source, a family of companies centered around serving the K-12 community. 
To learn more about how educators can leverage technology to drive successful educational outcomes, check us out at www.pacificonesource.com. Connect with us by searching for Learning Through Technology in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else podcasts are found. And click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. On behalf of the team at Pacific One Source, thanks for joining us.